translation process is we're going to require a book called a thesaurus. And in that thesaurus, you have a section that's called synonyms, and you have a section called antonyms. That's right. So you take everything in the life of Christ, you go to that thesaurus, and you go look for antonyms. And then you will find the correct description of you and I. So he was perfect. We are imperfect, right? Well, we are sinful. Now, there's a term that I want to coin, so you can all pick it up now. Righteousful. What does righteousful mean? Full of righteousness. What does full mean? Yeah, complete, full, no place for anything else, right? So Jesus was righteousful. So he was so full of righteousness, there wasn't room for anything else. You and I are sinful. What does that mean? So full of sin, there's no room for anything else. And that's it. So we are sinful. He took nothing personally. What about you and I? Everything. We always take it personally. Because right? we think it's about me. He had a love that was selfless. What about us? Our love is selfish. That's right. He responded perfectly to everything that ever happened to him. What about you and I? Yeah, not so much. And when we don't respond perfectly, well, do we hurt others? Yeah, so we're a perpetrator. All right. But not only are we a perpetrator, there's things that they said and did to us that we didn't ask for, we didn't like very much, and we hold on to. We hold on to. So we're the victim as well. And um, with that life, what kind of ripples do we have? Good ripples? Bad ripples. Well, the nice thing about ripples, the nice thing about ripples, is once they go... They're gone. You can't get them back. Right? I have taught people how to sin. And I can't unteach them how to sin. And I know the early influence of my life. And the friends that I had and the influence that I had and so on. And while God rescued me, a number of them are still living that other life. And I don't know if but my influence might have led them on in that direction and they might be lost forever because of that influence. Now, that's not to say that I'm the only influence in their life and the devil only had me to work with, but I can't get that influence back. I can't. And I can't undo what was done. The bad ripples have gone and they're there. Now, if you're not sure whether you have bad ripples or not, just have children. <laughs> and then you find out whether you've got bad ripples because you see you come out in the next generation. And if you're not convinced with that generation, just wait until you have grandchildren and you'll see it come out again. And we are powerless. Powerless to do the good, powerless to avoid the evil. Oh, we got plenty of power to do the evil and we have plenty of power to avoid the good, but not to do the good and avoid the evil. And we come to the cross with baggage, lots of baggage. And that life deserves, yeah, eternal death. Deserves eternal death. For he made him who knew no sin to what? Be sin for us. Now, a little departure. So, of course, we have the sanctuary service here. And uh, we've got Israel, and, you know, they're camped around, and uh, it's a pretty big camp, you know. I mean, 600,000-plus men of fighting age. 
Um, and uh, so it was a pretty big uh, camp there. And uh, if you send, then you got your little sheepy sheepy or whoever you had, and you were to bring that to the center of, of town. And maybe you live somewhere way out there in the outskirts, and maybe your neighbors, since it's tense, there's not a lot of uh, sound protection going on, and maybe they heard the argument that went on the night before, and they're waiting for when you're going to be going and grabbing that sheepy and putting a noose around its neck and taking it to the center of town. So the fact that you just bring it has a little bit of humble pie associated with it, because you walk past that neighbor's house, I mean tent, and that neighbor's tent, and that neighbor's tent, and you've got a nice looking lamb going to the center of town. And of course they heard last night. And so you come and you bring it, and you come and you come into the outer court here, and in that outer court, you take your hand and you lay it on the head of that sheep, and you confess your sin over that sheep. Now how much of, that sheep, how much of your sin did that sheep participate in? How much of it could it participate in? None. None. It, was, it, was, it, it has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with your sin. Just like Jesus. Never committed sin. Sinless, perfect, spotless lamb. Never had anything to do with your sin. But you confess your sin over the head of this lamb, and in symbol, that sin is transferred from you to the lamb. And then you pick up this knife and you apply pressure. If you've ever done anything of this nature, then you know if you don't have a very sharp knife, you've got to apply a lot of pressure in order to get through with these layers. Because there's wool. That's not easy to get through. There's skin, and it's pretty tight. There's, con so there's you know, the connective tissue and so on. But you're not just aiming for that. You've got to get deeper because you're really aiming to get to the carotids, because you want to cut off blood flow to the brain so it doesn't suffer for too long. And at your hand, that sheep bleeds to death. And the priest comes and he collects some of that blood and he puts it on the four corners of the altar of, of uh, sacrifice out here. And uh, the, the fat is separated from the lamb, at least certain portions of it, and burned separately on the altar. That's, that has a whole meaning in and of itself. Um, and twice a day, the priest does the same sacrifice and confesses the sin of Israel over a lamb, and it is sacrificed in a similar way, and the blood of that lamb is then taken into the holy place, past the, the showbread, right? which represents the throne of God, the Father and the Son, the candlestick, which represents the Holy Spirit, and the Christian's witness, right? the believer's witness, and this represents the Word of God as well, and then you have the altar of incense, which represents the prayers right? of the saints and the intercession of Christ. And, uh, and so that blood is put on the four corners of that altar of incense, some of it sprinkled in the uh, the curtain, and so the sin is transferred in symbol from the individual to the lamb, from the lamb to the priest, from the priest to the sanctuary, and then it stays there in the sanctuary all year until the day of atonement. That's right, and on that day a separate sacrifice is made. The blood of that is taken into the most holy place by the high priest and sprinkled on the mercy seat. Praise God, there's a mercy seat sprinkled on the mercy seat above the law that was broken under the Shekinah glory. And then that individual, that high priest, goes out into the outer court, and there is a goat waiting for him, Azazel, and lays his hand on that goat, confesses the sin of Israel for the whole year, and then Azazel is led out by a fit man uh, out into the wilderness and then let go out in the wilderness and that goat is watched to make sure it does not come back into the camp and it dies out in the wilderness without a supply of something to keep it alive. So there's that whole symbolism that was there. So when we consider the fact that Jesus became sin for us, then we take into account that sacrificial system and with that sacrificial system, we see 
that Jesus took the place of the sinner. The lamb took the place of the sinner, but the lamb did not participate in the sin, right? The lamb did not participate in the sin. In the same way, Jesus did not participate in sin. But in some way, he became sin. He didn't participate in it, but he became it. Right? And this is important as we go forward. <clears throat> so where in this whole system was the cross? Yeah, it's in the outer court, right? Right out there in the outer court. It was in the, it was in the outer court of earth that Jesus came to die, right? Not the inner court of heaven. And it was in the outer court of outside of Jerusalem that he died, right? It was where the lamb was sacrificed that he died, and, um, and so on. So, on the cross, who was it that was sinful? You've never been on a cross. Neither have I. All right, I wanna, on the cross, who was it that was sinful? Jesus, that's right. I'm not saying that he participated, just like the lamb never participated in the individual's sin. But in symbol, the lamb became the individual sin, in symbol. In reality, Christ became our sin. So on the cross, Jesus was the one who was sinful. On the cross, who was it that took everything personally? Jesus. On the cross, who was it that was selfish? Jesus. Again, not that he participated in it, but that he became it. Right. On the cross, who was the perpetrator? Jesus. And who was the unwilling victim? Jesus. Who was it that was left with the bad ripples you could never get back? Jesus. Who was it that was powerless to do the good and avoid the evil? Jesus. And who was it that was left with all the baggage? Jesus. That's right. You see, the only one who can pay the penalty for the inf infraction is the one who was guilty of the infraction. And so Jesus came and on the cross became you and me. And what penalty did it deserve? eternal death, the second death, the death of no hope of resurrection, the death of being under the condemnation of God, rightfully under the condemnation of God, and a sentence that is eternal. Welcome to the death he died. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So there's another side to this, and that is when you and I enter into the experience of the cross, who is it that is perfect? It's me. Who is it that has never taken anything personally, ever? Me. Who is it that has a selfless love? It's me. 
Who is it that responded perfectly to everything that ever happened? Me. Who is it that has the good ripples, the perfect ripples through all time and space? Me. Who is it that has power to do the good and avoid the evil? Me. And who is it that's left with no baggage? Me. Me. Yeah. <clears throat> A complete exchange of life for life, past for past, history for history, and that life deserves? Eternal life. Eternal life. That's right. Praise God. Hallelujah. So here we have made possible for us an exchange of life for life, past for past, history for history. You know, one's past seems to be, I call it the, the gun barrel. The things that you've experienced, the ways that you've responded, uh, the, you know, the situations that you've been through and so on, it tends to guide the motion of your life from that point forward. And it's almost impossible to break, three, break free from the inertia of the movement in that direction. And so, hence, individuals who are abused grow up and become abusers. And those that come from alcoholic parents end up becoming alcoholic and, and so on. And you see traits carried on from generation to generation because of that gun barrel. It's a very strong gun barrel. Because the purpose of the gun barrel is to take the bullet and cause it to move in a particular direction. Right? And the gun barrel of our lives always moves the bullet in the wrong direction. It'll never hit the bullseye of the target. And you can take that bullet and you can throw it in a bonfire. And if we go all standing around the bonfire, anybody feel comfortable? No. After somebody throws a bullet in the bonfire? No, because you don't know where it's going to go. You don't know who it's going to get or if it's going to get anyone. But if you're all standing around a bonfire and there's a gun with a gun barrel and it's pointing that direction, do you feel relatively safe? Sure. Sure. Because you know if the bullet goes anywhere, where is it going? Away from you. Yeah, it's going away from you. It's not going to come out of the gun barrel and go, hmm, nope, looks like fun over there. Ooh, turn around and go that way. No. So Jesus was not interested in getting our bullet and throwing it in the bonfire. He wasn't interested in coming and just erasing our past and our history and now giving us the, you know, the freedom to just choose a new direction. Because there's only one direction that makes it to the target. And so he came to live that gun barrel, to form it in his own life so that no matter what bullet you put in there, it hits the target. Now, let's dig in a little deeper. Let's imagine that um, you had a bad day and uh, you got in an argument with somebody and they were having a bad day too. And both of your bad days started rubbing on each other's bad days. And, you know, friction came. And frustration and anger and so on. And at the end of this interaction, there's one man left standing. It's you. And the other one is not. And you notice that they happen to not be breathing either. They're not moving at all. And it's a little bloody, and you check, and there's no pulse. Bad day. It's a bad day. It's one of those high ones on the list of a bad day. And, uh, and so, you know, you're not interested in going to prison or anything of that nature, and you've watched enough CSI or whatever else to figure out that there are ways of getting rid of evidence so that people don't find out what's going on. And so you do your level best to rid yourself of the evidence, and you do a good job, and nobody finds out that you did it. 
and uh, you know, an investigation and everything like that. You continue living in the community for a year or so to make sure it's not so um, suspicious for you leaving, but you don't like all the reminders, and so you leave town and you go move somewhere else. And you can go here and you can go there and you can get a new job and you can get a new house and you can go do whatever you want to, but the problem is everywhere you go, there you are. And you remember what you did. And you, you, if you're in a, if the Christian variety, then you know God remembers what you did because, you know, he was there too and he remembers and everywhere you go, you know he's there watching you too and you wonder when he's going to pull the trigger, you know. He might pull the trigger when you're driving through the intersection and that dump truck comes and bam, that's it, you're done. Or something or whatever, or somebody's going to find out and when they do, what's going to happen? So there's always fear, you're always looking over your shoulder, you're, there's always the guilt and the, you know, and so on that's chasing you around everywhere. And maybe this goes on for a number of years and you just don't want to go to prison, you don't want those consequences. But, you know, life is somewhat of a living hell because of all of this going on. And today you find out about the cross and you realize that what Jesus is offering to you, he's offering to step into your past, into your history, your timeline, so that he will become you. And he will take everything that your life has ever been, everything that led up to that murder, everything that you did and responded after that point, and he will take it as his very own and he will pay the penalty that that sin and that life deserves. And in exchange, he is going to move you into his timeline, his past, his history, so that you get everything that his life was. That's made possible to you by something that you could never pay for, you could never earn, you could never deserve. It's called grace. That's right. It's made possible for you by grace. That is God's working and his intervention in order to set you free. But that grace does not just become yours because it's there. Somebody doesn't go free just because God offers freedom. Because you, the gift doesn't become yours until you, until you take it, right? Until you take it. It might be offered, but it's not yours until you take it. What is it that does the taking? For by grace you have been saved through grace. your faith. That's right, your faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, right? Even faith is a gift of God. But faith must be exercised by ourselves to accept the gift. And so in that experience, you by faith accept that gift. In the moment you do so, who is not the murderer? You're not the murderer. In the moment you do so, you're not the murderer. Jesus became the murderer for you to set you free. Right. Now, you, you know, you learn and you grow and there's things like, uh, you know, repentance and uh, transparency and, and things like that. And the Holy Spirit's working on you and saying, you know what, you really need to fess up. There's people that are wondering what happened to their loved one and it's right for them to know. And so, you know, you, you suck it up and you go and you talk to somebody and you let them know and there's no statute of limitation on murder. And so uh, an investigation ensues and, and uh, you end up in jail and you end up in court and then they find you guilty and you end up in prison. You're right where you ho hoped you wouldn't be. Are you guilty or are you innocent? Okay. So, all right. So which verdict carries the day? The lower court or the higher court? The higher court. Lower court might say you're guilty. The, the state Supreme Court might say you're innocent. Well, okay, well they might say you're guilty. The appellate court might say you're guilty. But if the Supreme Court says you're innocent, you go free. 
So which court is higher, the earthly one or the heavenly one? Heavenly. The heavenly one. And what does the heavenly court say? Innocent. Innocent. Penalty paid. You have the righteousness of Christ. You're free. Earthly court says you're guilty and you're in prison. So before you were free in the body, but you were captive in the mind. Now you are free in the mind, but you're captive in the body. Your captivity has changed. But you can be free in prison. You can be free in prison. Now, the victim. Um, you know, there's a lot of bad things that happen. And we didn't ask for it. We didn't want it. We didn't like it. But it happened. And whatever they were and whoever they were, they said it, they did it, they, you know... And how do we feel about them when they do it? Do we like them? No. no. Do we want to be around them? No. Do we continue to be a channel of God's grace to them? No. We cut it off. <clears throat> Depending on what they do, do we hate them? Yeah. Now, I'll take a particular scenario, and it's a very common one, and that scenario is of, a, uh, of an individual being taken advantage of by another individual, somebody who should be protecting but is not, and taking an advantage of the individual in a certain way. And uh, it, it can be either way as far as the genders are concerned, but it tends to be higher from the male to the female, right? So we'll leave those details at that. Um, <clears throat> so when you have somebody that goes through that kind of scenario, first of all, was it wrong? Yes, yeah. yes absolutely. Was it evil? Yeah. Yes, it was evil, absolutely. Is there an excuse for it? No. no, there's no excuse for it. But the one whom it happened to, how do they respond? Self-protective. Um, angry. Yeah. Shame. Hatred. Yeah. I have asked many individuals who have gone through those situations said, if you, have, if you had the option to have infinite power and no accountability, infinite power and no accountability, what would you do to them? Yeah. Almost everybody would snap them out of existence. And then they stop and they reconsider. And then they back up and they say, no, that wouldn't be enough. What would they do? Torture, torture. torture them first and then kill them. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so the perpetrator is evil. But what is the victim? Evil too. Evil too. What is it that separates the perpetrator from the victim? Circumstances and opportunity. Circumstances and opportunity is what separates the victim from the perpetrator. If you had Hitler's genes, and if you had his upbringing, and if you had his exposures, 
and you had his inheritance of spirit from father and mother. And you had all of the circumstances of his life and his upbringing and the opportunities that were presented to him. You think you would behave any different? We have the choice. Yes, we think we do. If we did, we wouldn't be slaves to sin. Yeah. So let me give you this scenario to help us with this idea of choice. So let's imagine that you have grown up in a, uh, an old-time Native American in, uh, village. Teepees and, you know, it's an agricultural society. There's a nice lake, there's woods, there's other things like that. You have a small community. Uh, you, can, you, know, you can choose whether you're going to grow corn uh, in this patch or whether you're going to grow something else in this patch. You can choose whether you're going to go fishing today or whether you're not going to go fishing today. Uh, you can choose which kids you play with or which ones you don't and so on. But there's a legend, and that legend is if you go too far through the woods, there are headhunters out there and they'll get you. So make sure you don't go too far. And so you stay around and you have your choices and you do all of that kind of stuff and you choose whether you go swimming today or you don't go swimming today. You've got a, you got a million choices that you can make. But one day you go, start going wandering through those woods and you start working your way through and uh, you get farther than you ever have before and all of a sudden you walk up on something. You notice that there's a wall. It's a shiny, smooth wall and it's just... It's a few hundred feet, and it's just flat and up. And so you work your way along it, and it's contiguous. And you work away along that way, and it's contiguous. And you realize people are going to miss you, and so you go back home. And uh, you know, and then you start working your way through the woods every once in a while, slipping away, away. And you go follow that thing, and you follow that thing, and follow that thing. And after a number of months of slipping away and trying different parts of it, you come back to the original spot where you came to, and you realize you're surrounded by this wall, and there's no way out. You have a million choices inside, but you don't have a choice to get out. You're not free. So there are a number of choices that you and I have to make, but we don't have the choice ourselves to go free. <laughs> That does not mean that grace does not provide a way. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> but grace provides for us a choice that is not something that is native to ourselves. And there's one choice. All right, well, I'll talk about it now then. <clears throat> there is one choice that we are given that can lead to our freedom. And that choice is, whom will we serve? That is the choice that we are given. Whom will we serve? By God's grace, he has broken into this system of slavery to give us that one choice so that by that one choice, he can then free us and extract us from that because he cannot, he cannot extract us by force. He cannot extract us by deception. He cannot extract us by any of the enemy's means. He can only extract us in a straightforward way. And that's if we choose him. And in choosing him, he can work out the extraction process so that we can be free. Right? So, the victim <coughs> has the same heart and the same nature as the perpetrator. And if you take that same heart and that same nature and you put it in the same circumstances, 
with the same opportunities and the same gender and the same and hormones and the same everything, you'll get the same outcome. You'll get the same outcome. So it's not just the perpetrator that needs to be saved. It's the victim that needs to be saved too. And sometimes it's harder to convince the victim that they need a savior than it is the perpetrator. Because they justify their sinful response because of what they did. But there is no justification for sin in any form, regardless of what was done to you. And Jesus is proof that everything can be done to you and you can still respond with good. Not by our strength, not in our power, but in his. And that was the life that he lived. So between Jesus and me, Forget everybody else in the world, just the two of us. Between Jesus and me, before the cross, how many perpetrators are there? One. Who is it? It's me. Between Jesus and me, after the cross, how many perpetrators are there? One. Who is it? Jesus. All right, this is important. If you are still the perpetrator then you are still living in an experience that is before the cross. Because when you come to the cross, Jesus becomes the perpetrator for you, you go free. It's no longer you. And the guilt and the self-hatred and the shame and so on associated with being the perpetrator can no longer be yours because it's his. By its very nature, the cross sets you free from being the perpetrator. You cannot enter into the experience of the cross and continue to be the perpetrator. You can't. Its very nature sets you free from that. <clears throat> Between Jesus and me, before the cross, how many victims are there? One, who is it? me. After the cross, between Jesus and me, how many victims? Who is it? Jesus. Jesus. Same thing. If you are still the victim, if you're still the one they said and did those things to, if you're still struggling with that resentment, bitterness, hatred, revenge, and so on, then you're still living in an experience that is before the cross. Because when you come to the cross, Jesus takes your place. He becomes the victim for you. And everything that goes along with that victimhood is his. It's not yours. You cannot enter into the experience of the cross and continue to be the victim because by its very nature, the cross sets you free from being the victim. Anybody want to be free? Yeah. Yeah. This is the only place where you can go free. And this is the only way that you can go free. Is right here at the cross. And it's freedom for the perpetrator. And it's freedom for the victim. And it gives you power. And it gives you the perfection of his life and everything that his life was. And the moment faith takes hold of that gift, then you have the life of Christ and everything that that life was. And when the father looks at you, he sees the perfection of his son. And he who said, this is my son, with him I am well pleased, says to you, this is my child, whom I love, 
with him or her, I am well pleased. Right. Now, Jesus does not remain the sin. Yes, he was the sacrifice. Yes, he became our sin, but he doesn't remain our sin. He resurrected and he went to heaven as our heavenly high priest. And as our heavenly high priest, he ministers in the heavenly sanctuary on our behalf through his spilt blood and the sacrifice that blood shed once for all. He ministers in the heavenly sanctuary and that sin is transferred from him to the sanctuary the heavenly sanctuary, and it remains there until the end of the judgment, the end of the investigative judgment. And then he puts on kingly robes and he comes back to take his children home, and the goat is sent off in the wilderness alone, without resources, and he waits out his time. And then all of that sin is placed on the head of that scapegoat and he pays for the sin that he caused God's children to commit. And those who remain with that sin upon themselves pay their own price. And so he wants to get as many as possible on his side so he doesn't have to pay the price for them. <clears throat> And when you and I enter into this experience of the cross, well, we give God all of our heart that we're aware of, which isn't much. And so does he want a little bit or does he want all of it? He wants all of it. So we give him a little bit, but it's all that we're aware of, so he accepts it as a, as a complete gift because it's all that we're aware of. But then, well, he needs to reveal to us more of what's there. So, he lets our, noddle, our bottle get knocked over. And it comes spilling out so that we can see what's still inside. So that when that comes spilling out, well, we can come right back to the cross. <laughs> I can say, oh, Lord, that too? <laughs> yeah, that too. All right, Lord, I give it to you. Take it from me. Here it is. And I'm going to accept that perfect life of Jesus on my behalf. And thank you for taking my sin. And give me a new heart. Right? A new heart to love you and to respond differently. And he does. Now, you go from the pre-cross to the after-cross experience by faith, by believing, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, right? That you should not perish but have everlasting life, right? Now, what kind of believing, what kind of belief are we talking about? So it's not this kind of belief. 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 It's that kind of belief. You put your whole weight on it. So that if it were to give way, you do too. <laughs> right? No, it's a faith that puts your whole weight into it. Right? It's a belief that trusts. Yeah, well... <laughs> Yes, the panel bench may drop you. Yeah. Jesus never will. Now, the enemy, when you make this decision, will tempt you, 
to believe it wasn't real. No, 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 you really didn't. It really wasn't that. And indeed, we have times where doubt may take control. <laughs> and we go taking it all personal again. And we find ourselves over here carrying the burden, all that kind of stuff. Oh, it didn't work. No, it did. <laughs> so, all right, you got up and you fell down. What do you need to do? Get up. Get up. <laughs> How? By faith, same way you did last time. Love yeah. And over time, you spend more and more time over here, and there's less and less that trips you up, and you end up back over here. Until eventually you live here, and you never go back there. Right. So... How much of your sin did Jesus pay for? All of it. That was all of it. Does that mean everything you ever did? Yes. yes. Does that mean everything you would ever do? Yes. yes. Yeah. So does God know the future? Yes. yes. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So when Jesus paid for my sin, he did so knowing everything that would ever come. And he didn't just throw a blanket of grace over everything. No, he paid for each and every individual sin on the cross from everybody that would ever commit sin from the beginning of sin to the end of sin, every bit of it. And for everyone who would never accept the gift, he paid the price. He paid the price for every sin that Cain ever committed. He paid the price for every sin that Hitler ever committed. He paid the price for everyone, for every sin. And when he accepts you as his child, he does so knowing everything that will ever come up in your life. And so that means nothing will ever come up that will make him say, oh, whoops, forgot to pay for that one. Oh, whoops, that was too big, too big for me. No, sorry, you're left with that one. Never, it'll never be. Because he foresaw it all, and he paid for it all, and he made a way for it all. You see, he already paid the price. So you don't have to worry when you fall whether he will accept you again or not. In fact, his acceptance never went when you fell. All right, parents, anybody ever have a child that learned to walk? Yeah? yeah? I've had a few. You know what they do? It's really frustrating. You know what they do when they learn to walk? They fall. They fall. That's right. So how many of you parents, when the child fell, went, oh, you stupid. <laughs> Why'd you fall? Next model. How many of you did that? No. What'd you do when the child took the first step? Yes, go, oh, great, yes, yeah, that's wonderful. Take them up, have a celebration, and all that kind of stuff. Did you pay attention that they fell? No, no you paid attention that they took a step, right? And nowadays, with the modern everything, you know, it's a different story. It's like, you see what's about to happen. They're holding on to the edge of the coach, the, belt, the binkies over here, and they're just about to let go, and you're like... <laughs> yes! Yes! So good! Right? <laughs> And now you can post it on Facebook and everybody can see the baby took the first step. <laughs> You're excited that they took the first step. Now, how many times are you going to allow your child to fall in the process of learning to walk? Seven times? 
70 times 7? You got the checkbook there? You know, you're not the, not the like, writing checks checkbook. You're, you're checking. And that, oh, no. Uh-oh, 485? Oh, no. 486? Oh, no! 487! Oh, 488! 489! 490! Oh, I got to get rid of this one. All right. <laughs> as many falls as it takes to learn to walk. Does Jesus know how many falls it'll take for you and me? Yeah. They're counted thousands of years ago. He knows. It's not a problem to him. The falling is not a problem. What is he concerned about? Get back up. That's it, get back up. Don't have a pity party on the floor. Don't pity yourself and stay down there and, you know, and all that. Just get back up. Keep going. It's not a problem to fall. All right, let me say this to Adventists. It's not a problem to fall. Right, let me say this to the Adventists of Adventists. It's not a problem to fall. It's a problem to stay down. That's the problem. A righteous man falls seven times in three minutes. It doesn't give a time frame, does it? No, and it's renewable, isn't it? Yeah, righteous man falls seven times. Oh, eighth time, you're done for. No, <laughs> seven is a complete number, right? So a righteous man falls seven times, and seven times gets back up. So guess what a righteous man does? He falls. That's what a righteous man does. He falls. But he gets back up. That's right. He gets back up. Jesus already paid the price. He already, he already knew what you would do. It's not a, 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 you know, a shock to him when it comes. It's like, oh, no, I can't believe he did that. No, Gabriel, can you believe it? Oh, no, he's not like that at all. He knew you would do it. He already paid the price. It's not a problem. Accept the grace that's fully there for you. Enter back into the experience of the cross. Let him set you free. Let him give you the righteousness that he has. When? Right now, what did he do to that woman who was caught in the middle of adultery? I mean, can you imagine a more embarrassing experience of life than to have been caught in the act of adultery and now dragged by Pastor Kinney? And uh, yeah, anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, no, all right, I'm not gonna pick on people anyway. All right, and, and, and you know, and the rest of the pastoral stuff, and be dragged, and by me, and dragged into the middle of the church, poop, while church is going on, and the guy is preaching, and now your deed is made broadcast to everyone. Can you imagine how bad that would be? And now there's execution. That's bad. It's a bad day. When did Jesus offer her forgiveness? Right, there. right then. Right there. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Get up. Right? Get up. Now, because he, automatic, because he already paid the price, does that mean that I'm automatically forgiven? No. No. It, grace provides for the give, forgiveness, but faith, faith complies with the conditions and accepts the forgiveness. Right? Are there conditions for forgiveness? Sure. If we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? That's a conditional statement, if we confess, right? So confession is part of it. And it talks about confessing and forsaking, right? That's repentance, 
Right? That's a part of it as well. But do you, need to, do you need to forsake your sin before you come to the Savior? No, that's a huge issue that I see. People are like, oh, well, I'm not repentant, so I can't come to him yet. And I, and I you know, I'm like, really? Where are you going to get the repentance from? Like, are you going to go, oh, there's the repentance. All right, now I can come to God. Does it work that way? No, it's, no, not at all. You you don't have anything to save you. You just go to him. He's got everything to save you. Just come back. Come back to him. Yes, it's faith in Christ that his sacrifice is for me, and it's sufficient for my sin. And by that, I'm justified. And what are the results of forgiveness? I have no more guilt, even though I still remember what happened. He doesn't wipe away the, the memories. If he did, we'd have no testimony. And I have no more bitterness, because guess what? It wasn't done to me. They didn't do it to me. They did it to Jesus. And what did he say? He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They're crazy. And if the one who now is the victim said, Father, forgive them, who am I to say, well, God, burn them? No. It's not me anymore. Jesus took my place. And I love them because God loves them, and I want them to go free just like he set me free. And I will cooperate with the Holy Spirit in assisting in their freedom. Mm. There's freedom at the cross. Freedom at the cross. And forgiveness allows us to enter back into relationship. So the cross reconciles relationship. <clears throat> You know, there's an, I'm going to close with this. There's an interesting occurrence when you read the great controversy and the destruction of the wicked. Satan there, the wicked are resurrected. He, he, he convinces them that they can take the city by force. They spend time making implements of war and so on so that they can come and take the celestial city and, and take, you know, and Satan's the rightful uh, ruler of this and so on, and they'll take care of the usurper and, and whatever. And so who knows how much time there is in this whole process of making implements of war and planning things and, and so on. And then they finally, they finally march on the city. And so you have this, this innumerable throng of individuals that are coming and they're starting to march on the city. And Jesus does something very interesting at that point. He closes the gates of the city. The wicked were resurrected and the gates were open. They were making their implements of war and the gates were open. They were doing all their planning and everything and getting ready and the gates were open. All of this time, who knows how much time this will be, the gates are open. But guess what? Nobody goes in. And nobody goes out. Because it's evident that everybody has already chosen which side they will be on. Nobody is left out because God shuts the door. Everybody is left out if they're left out because they wouldn't walk through the door. Let that not be us. With a grace that's so full and so free and so wonderful to set us free from everything we have ever been and we have ever experienced and we have ever been through so that we can be the life of Christ, the righteousness of God in him now. You want that? Yes. Stand with me and let's pray for it. Dear Heavenly Father, here we are. Yeah, we've got a past. And you knew all about it. We've got, well, as they sometimes say, stuff. We've got stuff. 
lots of it. But we see that you're offering to us the perfection of your life, the beauty of everything your life was so that it might be ours. And you take all the garbage that our lives have ever been and you make them yours. Oh, Lord, we want that. We need that. We must have that. We perish without it. And you offer it to us. And now with eyes closed and heads bowed, we see you handing us that gift, holding it in your hand. And Lord, we choose to reach out and take it, to accept it, that it might be ours. That we might be free in Jesus. That in this very moment, we know the Father is smiling down on us and he is well pleased with us. And we have none of the record of the sin of our past. It's no longer us. They didn't do it to us. They didn't say it to us. It wasn't us who did it. You set us free. Thank you, Jesus, for setting us free. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.